Hey YouTube, welcome to another Valkyrie Connect video. My name is Akeo and today we'll be going over some beginner tips such as mana, diamond, and team management. But before I get started, I want to let everyone know that this is the first video of a multi-video series that I'll be working on. We'll start off with more beginner type mechanics and then move on to more advanced things as the video series progresses. And before I continue to ramble on, let's get started. So the first thing you want to do is to log in. Log in every day so you can get your dailies, do your dailies, and also work towards the 7 day, 14 day login bonuses where you can choose between Niji, Thor, or Freya as the heroes. And that will help you progress through the game a lot more given that you don't have to pay diamonds for them. Second is to do all your dailies every day. It seems like there's a lot, but really it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes. So take your time to do that, and once you get into the habit of things, you'll be able to finish it quickly. Second off is look at your total and limited time achievements. You want to get those done as well, because as you complete them, you gain diamonds. So every time you do something new, every time you hit a new threshold in terms of the arena, in terms of promotion, anything like that, you'll get diamonds. So keep a tab on that and try to get as many as you can, even completing level 1, level 2, level 3 connects. Next, do the arena. Even though you don't feel like you're ready, just do it because every time you get a new arena ranking, you gain diamonds. And your current rank dictates how much you get per day as you log in for arena diamonds. So try to get that, and when you're able to, do the grand arena. And because once you get that unlocked, same thing with the arena, you gain diamonds as you hit new ranks, and your current rank dictates how much you get in per day. So as you try to rank up and try to keep your current position in the arena and grand arena, you'll get an additive amount every day as you log in. Alright, next up is the story. Try to do the story quest. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, it says X amount of stars out of 15 or 12. You'll notice that once you fill that up, you unlock the chest at the bottom. Looking at new cutscenes also unlocks diamonds for you, so try to get those done. And while we're talking about quests, each hero has their own quest. When you complete the entire story, getting 3 stars in each of the main quests, as well as the cutscenes, you'll gain 330 diamonds total. It's well worth your stamina, and you might as well do it, because that also unlocks the souls that you can get per day for the specific hero. So if you ever find yourself needing diamonds and you have some spare stamina, you might as well go through your hero quests and see which ones you haven't done, so you can get some extra diamonds for those discount or star party summons that come in every month or every so often. So that's pretty much it for beginners getting diamonds, just get all of those things done and you'll rack up diamonds fairly quickly within your first few weeks, first month playing. Next up we'll be talking about mana. There's really not much to talk about since there are two ways to really get mana, through questing or through connects. If you do connects, you're guaranteed the mana. As you climb up into connects, they become larger and larger from small medium to large mana pots. When you do the quests, they also do increase in size as you increase the chapters in the questing, but they're not guaranteed. So if you're looking at efficiency, you should be spending your stamina on orbs and then getting the mana along the way, but since we're talking about mana and mana consistency, connects is the way to go. While we're on the subject of mana, I'll be going over a few 10 shots to kind of put in my inventory and show you guys which items you should sell, which ones you should keep, and which ones you can feed to your gear to level up. And just to keep in mind that the blacksmith trader offers a wide variety of great gear. You can get purity ring, you can get ring of Niflung on there, glacial cloak, as well as reforge blade and ring. And that way you can 4 star, 5 star your gear. To start off, the gear that I'm selling currently are my hero specific gear. I have duplicates of them or I have already 5 star them so there's no need to keep them. And I'm also selling off the gold ring and blades because that's all they're meant for is just to sell for the tokens. One thing to keep in mind is don't upgrade a gear preemptively. If you somehow in the future find that you need some extra tokens, if you increase a 2 star to a 3 star to a 4 star or a 5 star, it will still sell for the same price. Versus if you kept it in its broken form where you have multiple 2 stars, you'll get 100 tokens for each one. So if you have the inventory space, just save it for later and then sell it or increase and promote it if necessary. 
As you see on the top, it says that I can hold 410 items. If you didn't know, you can hit the plus sign and increase your inventory size for 10,000 mana. And that's a huge, huge quality of life where you don't have to constantly go back and forth between mana summoning and the blacksmith to empty out your inventory. Once I finish selling off these items, I'll be going over the items that you should be keeping. Just know that there are more items out there, but when I go over these items, hopefully you'll understand more of that what stats to look for, which abilities to look for in the particular item so you can keep it. Use it as a filler and so you get more progressive and best in slot gear. The first item I want to go over is the Mage's Bolero and this gear is a magic defensive gear piece. It's a great gear for beginners and it's an awesome filler and so you find more magic defensive gear later on. The next piece I want to go over is Chainmail. This one is a physical version of Mage's Bolero and it gives HP as well as physical defense in the skill. The next piece I want to go over is called Blessed Helm. It's pretty much a lower tier version of a Druid's Cloak where it increases the HP by 5% for each skill level you have starting off at a base 10%. And it also gives you physical damage mitigation. Just know that every item that you find in the Mana Summon is usable. They can be used as a filler for later on until you get better gear. They're not that bad, such as the Magma Rod is high attack for what it offers. It gives both attack and magic attack while dealing fire damage as well. All of the items you see on the screen, they're usable. I just didn't prefer them when I first started out. I chose other items, plus you get items from the diamonds that you get initially. But, you know, choose what you can and make use of what you have. Now let's go over the accessories. The first item I wanna go over is the Warrior Ring. It increases the user's attack by a certain percentage. That percentage increases every time you increase the skill. Players use this even in endgame. It's a great item to keep, so don't toss it out, you get it. The next item is the defensive version of Warrior Ring where it gives a physical defense of 10%. It increases by 5% for every skill level. It still has its attack, magic attack capabilities, but the skill doesn't offer any offensive capabilities. Next up we have Mystic Earrings. It's an awesome earring for magic defense. It starts out at a base 10%, increases by 5% for each skill that you upgrade it with. And the base stat that it gives is magic attack and magic defense, which isn't too bad for something you get from the mana summon, right? Try to keep that handy and make multiple copies of it. It's easily 5 starred if you have enough mana and have enough of these. And pretty much that's it. Besides that, just every excess gear that you get from the mana, give it to your other gear that you're trying to level. Your goal initially is to try to get all of your gear pieces to level 20, since it scales very fast. And once you get all of your gear to 20, you want to push for the next 5 or 10 levels. Outside of that, we'll be going on another topic with team composition, and why players want to choose a certain composition over another. With team composition, ideally what you want is a tank, a melee, two mages, and a range. Why is that? It's because it segments up your team into rows. Right now you see Luka and Thor is row 1, Hell and Gull is row 2, and Momiji is row 3. You'll notice that if you look at certain hero abilities, they either attack the first row or the first furthest row, or the first X enemy or the furthest X enemy. Having your team divided up helps protect those towards the middle. Not only does it allow protection towards your team with the segmentation that you have, it also allows variety. If you have a team full of melees, there's a limited amount of weapons, armors that you can equip, as, as well as abilities. So if you make your team more diversified, it increases the pool of armor and weapons that you can have, as well as the available abilities that you have within that team as well. So for example, if you have a team full of melees, if a hero attacks one specific row, it will be inflicting damage or CC upon your entire team. But the moment you add in another type, such as a mage or a range, it segments it off. So keep that in mind when you have team compositions. Remember the ideal team is two melees, two mage, and one range. But there are those who use two melees, three melees, with a combination of one or two mages with a range or no range. 
So experiment, see what works best for you, and see if you need to alter it later on as you progress through the game. Next up, we'll be going over the tanks. We'll be going over the most popular three. I know there are more in the game, but these are the most ass, which is Heimdall, Luka, and Niji. First up, we have Heimdall, who is an Izer and is also a male. Him being a male will restrict him to some gear that he can equip, and being an Izer will make him susceptible with some CC. Next, if you look at his HP, defense, and magic defense, it's actually considerably high for a base stat. Him having a good resistance towards fire, water, earth, and light is good, until you look at his dark. The biggest setback is the popularity of dark equipment, dark weapon, dark heroes. Next, we'll look at his ability. His ability grants a barrier to your entire team towards physical damage for 100% of their HP or for two turns. The biggest setback to this is that it doesn't stop magic damage. And when we talked about teams consisting of two or three mages, when your barrier only stops physical damage, it may be hurtful for you to not have a way to mitigate or to negate magic damage. Especially when most magic damage is dark, you will have Heimdall pretty much be the first to fall, just because he can't stop magic damage. Next, looking at his limit burst, it sounds really good since it takes the average of the attack and magic attack, but you have to realize that one, he's a tank, two, he's a melee, so the magic attack is going to be very low. And the only advantage you can see from his limit burst is the defensive capabilities of increasing the defense and magic defense for 10%. And, I mean, you can use it in connects, but I can't really see a use for it in PvP. Next up is Luka. She's a human and a female, so it increases the amount of gear that she can equip. But she is susceptible to a lot of CC due to being a human. Looking at her base HP, defense, and magic defense, it's fairly average. It's not great, but it's actually not really bad either. The biggest advantage to her right now in terms of comparing her with Heimdall and the other tank is that she has an overall resistance towards the elements. So you don't have too much of something or too little of something where if you face an opponent with that elemental type, they can capitalize on it. Taking a look at her ability, it's an absorption barrier for both attack and magic attack for 50% of the hero's HP. And if you have any teams that have 50% or less HP, she'll guard for them. And it's just not one unit, it's anyone on the team that's 50% or lower HP. The other advantage to this ability is not only that it protects against both physical and magical attack, the absorption barrier not only stops the incoming attack but it also heals her for the damage that she's supposed to be taking for 50% of her HP, which is really good in sustainability, making her a very powerful tank. Another advantage that she has is that her limit burst is common across a lot of melees. So if you have a melee with the same limit burst, it increases the damage by 10% each time, stacking up to 50% extra damage. Team comps that share the same limit burst will deal more damage overall. So you have another melee sharing her limit burst, you'll be dealing 120% damage. If you have a second melee, it goes up to 130% damage, making this a very good limit burst for its offensive capabilities. Next up we have Niji. She's a Dwarven female which makes her immune to a lot of CC and also allows her to equip a wide variety of equipments. If you're looking at her base stats, her HP is fairly low, her defense and magic defense is pretty average. If you're looking at her elemental wheel, the dark, light, earth, and fire resist is really good, but the water is fairly low. It shouldn't affect her too much since in the meta currently you don't see much water users outside of Thrud and Dress Saber, which not many people use anyways. People will use Thor instead of Thrud, or people will use Saber instead of Dress Saber. Looking at her ability, if you look at the defensive portion of it, it blocks against attack and magic attack damage for 100% of her HP, or one turn which is really good since one, she's a dwarf and she's immune to a lot of CCs and two, she's frontline, right? So the incoming damage is going towards her more likely than behind her unless the opponent has equipped some type of weapon or has some type of heroes that bypasses that. Her limit burst isn't really popular among the melee classes but it's still not a bad limit burst. 
the fact that it's not some off-limit burst that has nothing to do with melee types is really good. You can still stack this limit burst with another type of melee that shares the same limit burst to increase the damage, but honestly I would prefer her to have balanced tombs since a majority of the melees hold that type of limit burst than the Grand Strike. And now since you have a general idea of each of the tanks, what they're capable of, and which type of damage that they'll be absorbing or taking for the team. I'm going to rank them from rank 1, 2, and 3 from rank 1 being the best, rank 3 being the worst of the three. And just remember this is just my opinion of how I evaluate it. You might have a different opinion and it's totally fine. First up we have Luka, Niji, and Heimdall. I chose Luka being first because she absorbs both physical and magical attack damage and on top of that her barrier is an absorption barrier that heals her with the incoming damage for 50% of her HP. And not only that, any teammates that have 50% HP or less, she blocks it for them. So this is really good if you're able to activate her ability before an incoming AoE attack or a limit burst. Secondly, her base stats are fairly good, her HP defense and magic defense, her elemental wheel resists pretty much all of the elements fairly well, so I put her first just because of how well-rounded she is. I chose Niji second because she absorbs the physical and magical attack, but she has no way to defend her team outside of her just being in the front lines. Her stats are okay, they're not too bad. Her elemental wheel, like I said before, it's really good because the element that she's weak at is not very popular right now in PvP. Aside from Thrud, Dresssaver, and Scotty. And lastly, I have Heimdall being third out of the three, mainly because he has no way to stop incoming magic attack outside of stacking magic defense. Though his base stats are really high, the elemental wheel puts him at a disadvantage since his weakest element is dark and that's a really popular element right now in the meta. You have Odin, you have Ymir, you have Gold, you have Hell, and the list can keep going on and on and on. And outside of heroes, you have weapons that also deal dark damage, which will increase the damage that he's going to be taking on throughout the fight. And one of the last few things I want to go over is following a player. You want to follow somebody, whether from your guild or one of the top 20 players on the game. Just follow them because you never know when you may need them for either Onslaught or quests later on that you can't pass, especially the later chapters in the story. And not only that, you help them out by giving them mercenary tokens and they help you out by overcoming content that you normally wouldn't be able to progress through. And lastly, join a guild. Get yourself involved with other players, communicate, interact with everyone else. This is an online game, so you want to put yourself out there and just have people to chat with. Being in a guild also helps you get guild exclusive gear if they do guild wars, and you can help up to 9 players a day to get a total of 90 stamina, which you can use towards orbing, questing, doing it in connects, and it's honestly just more fun playing with other people. On the topic of people, there is a subreddit for Valkyrie Connect as well as a Discord if you want to get yourself involved, meet new people, and also find players to help you as well. I'll provide both links in the description below. If you like the video, please like the video, and if you want to see more content like this, please subscribe. I'll see you guys next time in the next video. Take care.